Molly Cooney is a queer writer, mother, and teacher who spends as much time as possible outdoors. She graduated with her MFA in creative nonfiction from the University of Arizona and is currently participating in the Loft Mentor series. Her work has appeared in the Gettysburg Review and the North Dakota Quarterly. A fourth generation St. Paulite, Molly has crossed the river and now lives in a century old house in South Minneapolis with her partner, two year old baby, and four legged friends. Please welcome Molly Cooney. Thank you. sitting there too, mumbling, so let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so I'm working on a project that's just at the beginning uh, where I'm kind of exploring the idea of transition. And um, so it's kind of becoming about several different stories, and I'm going to read two small pieces um, about, well, transition. Um, and they happen to both actually be about babies, so who knew that was the theme? We didn't plan this, <laughs> again, you know, we all have mothers, so we were late, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think that's all the background you need to know. Um, and the person, Anne, is my partner. Okay, here we go. I don't know how to do this, it's kind of awkward. All right, disconnect. Do you even want the baby? Anne whispered across the vast space between the driver's seat and the passenger seat. Silence. I wanted to say yes, to shout it even, but I couldn't. I really couldn't. After we poured our life savings and all our emotional reserves into a variety pack of hormone shots, vials of sperm shipped across the country, dozens of intervaginal ultrasounds, and 17 catheters of swimmers popped through my cervix, I couldn't even say yes. Yes, I want the baby, of course I do. I couldn't say that. I couldn't say anything at all. The silence contracted the air in the car, pushing so hard I nearly lost my breath. The stifling made me gag, then gagging to heaving, and still we drove in silence heavy as lead. Until that moment, the day had been a rare and relatively beautiful one for Anne and I. I'd voluntarily left the house, ambitiously agreeing to go to Afton State Park and watch the St. Croix River. Mid-July morning sun warmed the air to a perfect 75 degrees, by the time we parked and started to walk to the water. My belly announced our presence first, its giant bulge a magnet for any eye within a mile. So many sweet glances, Anne said. People are happy for you. People have no idea, I said. 10 minutes of winding trails and rustic steps got us to the wooden bench 100 feet above the river. Wind off the water brushed my skin, intensifying the nausea. One breath, two, we sat watching the swollen swirls of the river, Anne with her tussle of brown hair and dimpled smile, and me with my barky burps. She took my hand and we rested on the weathered wood, watching red-tailed hawks play in the thermals and sailboats tack from shore to shore. For that moment, I felt close to Anne in a way the overwhelming pregnancy sickness hadn't allowed before. But by the time we walked back to the car, a new wave of nausea was sinking me, and it was then, as we started the drive home, that Anne asked, do you even want the baby? And silence took over the car. The cornfield and apple orchard lined road gave way to I-94 and the miles clicked by in the quiet summer sun. The St. Paul skyline rose on my left. The whisper of the Mississippi weaving through the skyscrapers past First National Bank and the cathedral over the Capitol Dome. The echo of Anne's question. We'd be home in 20 minutes. Then I could retreat to my room and sleep away another hour or day of nausea. I looked down at my swollen hands resting on the black skirt that I wore, literally, every day. How could I have nothing to say? Fingering the fabric of my navy tank top that draped loosely over my giant belly, I kept thinking, just say yes. I owned five of the exact same shirts and I rotated through them daily. Before getting pregnant, I hadn't worn a dress in a decade and tank tops were reserved for jogs and Sunday morning biscuits. But the nerve endings in my skin increased exponentially during pregnancy and any contact with my flesh seared me with nausea. The pressure of pants was unthinkable. I could wear the skirt and the tank top because they were light and loose and barely touched my skin, minimal seams and stretchy fabric. I'd wanted this baby for years, been so excited to grow a little one, feel the flutter kicks and rip jabs, rib jabs. I'd planned to have the pregnancy that crossed the marathon finish line days before the birth. 
The cute belly with still strong legs is able to hike backcountry trails and bike to the grocery store even in the third trimester. Then on January 12th at 9 a.m., the nausea slammed into my chest and wedged itself there until September 9th at 1.18 a.m. That's not first trimester morning sickness. Not a few hard weeks and then relief. It was 34 weeks, two days, four hours, and 18 minutes of fierce, relentless nausea. That's 241 days of wishing I would die. I glanced from the window to Anne, her hands tight on the wheel, slow tears on her cheeks. I'm lonely, she said. I feel so alone in this. I grabbed a compassion, wanting to reach Anne, but caught only anger, thinking of the months I spent in my bed alone, unable to interact or even have lights on, curtains shut tight, too sick to read, the unimaginable thought of standing up to go pee. No talking, no music, no hugs. Anything but dark silence made the nausea worse. I'd call Anne on the phone if I needed something. And yes, Anne had slept on the living room floor for three and a half months and ate dinner in the car every night because the scrape of the spoon on the bowl sent me reeling. And yes, she did everything to manage our lives, take care of me, prepare for the baby. But I was the one who was drowning in nausea between the sheets alone. Didn't that count for something? I was the one who would shake and sweat another 60 seconds of my pregnancy away in bed, take a breath and do it again and again. Anti-emetic drugs, IV fluids, steroids. I begged the doctor to put me under for just a day, a few hours of respite from the haunting nausea. Months of that. That is loneliness I didn't even know was possible. If I'd had a strength that, the strength that day in the car, I would have screamed into the windshield, alone? You feel alone? What the fuck are you talking about? Instead, I put one breath in front of the other and held tight to the shame that overshadowed the nausea for just a heartbeat. I can't say it. I can't even say I want it. I'm 34 weeks pregnant with the baby I fought fiercely to have, and I can't say it. I can't even say, yes, my little one, I want you. Now transition to yet another uplifting moment. Um, this one's about my sister, called Suspended. It's a little bit shorter. My sister's one and a half pound baby didn't die as deeply as they told her to. I mean, the doctors didn't wish for that, but that is the story written when a micro preemie is born at 26 weeks gestation. She will die each day many times in the coming weeks and months, the neonatologist told my ripped open little sister who hadn't even met her tiny kid yet. Katie couldn't have known then just how tight the air could get when her daughter's swish swish would still, the ripples recede as the beep 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 brought the NICU nurses shoving through the pale pink curtain, ripping the saran wrap roof off the incubator and rubbing, or shocking, the nickel-sized heart to beat again. Her fist was the heart on her hand, reminding us that she would clench her muscles still. Saran wrap? I asked Katie after seeing the photo of my two-day-old niece. It takes too long to tear the incubator top off when her heart stops, she said, her blonde hair damp on her forehead. Still the baby died, sincerely died, so many times each day that it became a number as common as telling time. Ten this morning, only five, two in the first hour. Katie's face grayed in those months she lived in the Ronald McDonald house, pumping every two hours, freezing milk in the rusty 1990s freezer for the hopeful Sunday suck and her baby continued to die every day. I was supposed to get married six days after my sister's water broke. Katie was supposed to be on a plane within hours of when, hours of when the gush of amniotic fluid hit the white tile of the small town Alabama grocery store she had stopped at for broke trip food. It was October and she was supposed to be pregnant until February. I had just come back from jogging along the Yellow and Mississippi River, past the Ford plant and down to Hidden Falls when I got the call about Katie. My breath caught as I sunk onto the couch, my running shirt tight across my back. This is it, I thought. This is what defines our family. My sister had a baby that died. But the baby waited in the fluidless amniotic sac for days, and Katie lay flat, not moving, even to pee. The lights, minimal talking, quiet music, anything to keep her body calm. Steroids injected into my sister's IV, passed through the umbilical cord to tuck in her baby's lungs, prepare them to understand air, for months, months before they were supposed to. Each hour the baby stayed in my sister, each minute gave her infinitesimally more hope for survival. I'm scared, Katie whispered. Of course, I said, imagining her lying there, a thousand miles away, 
catheterized and hooked to more machines than she could count, her blue eyes strong and clear. Dude, I said, you got this one. I think I do, she said. Hours later, my niece was born. On my once upon a time wedding day, my dress hung like a hospital gown on the closet door, wingtips and bow tie waiting for another day. My niece, barely bigger than my hand, transparent skin pulled shiny over chicken bones, nerves too raw to be touched, hovered between life and death. My sister sat in the NICU, tracing her finger along the saran wrap ceiling between her and her baby, watching the tiny chest rise to the force of the ventilator, wanting to adjust the tubes, straighten the gauze, graze her daughter's cheeks just once so she would know her mama's lips, feel her breath no matter what. The baby's heart kept stopping. Beep, beep, beep. The rush of nurses restart, the stopping again. The baby turned eight months old on our redo wedding day. By then, she had died hundreds of times, but she never really meant it. Thanks.